All right, hello and welcome back, fellow BCIers. This is uh, Will Coon again with Module 5 and a short video on machine learning. This is a companion to the other set of minisodes we covered, looking at the mathematics of decoding spiking population data. Today, we're going to be looking at a broad overview of machine learning techniques uh, that are used in BCI and consider some of the advantages and disadvantages of each. And I also just want to make you aware of a lot of resources I've found personally helpful in my quest to better understand all of these methods. So a brief look at what this lecture is and what this lecture is not. This, in contrast to the minisodes even, is not a detailed look at the mathematical intricacies of each of the methods that you'll see. Those should be covered in a dedicated ML course, which I'm sure all of you are either eager to take or have already taken and just loved it, if you're anything like the rest of the people in the BCI world, including me. What this is, again, is a broad overview or kind of an inventory of our toolbox. And in thinking about all of these methods, um, I'd like to remind you to consider two questions. Uh, when do I use this technique? And what are the critical considerations or components that I need to consider uh, when making a decision about which I'm going to apply to my BCI problem? And we'll cover some example applications of each of these. One broad theme that I noticed in kind of preparing all this material is that in contrast to the minisodes that focused on spike population decoding, a lot of these methods are less on the degenerative side, more on the discriminative side, and lend themselves well to many of the non-invasive approaches that we've touched on. But of course, there's more nuance than that broad brush stroke and we'll take each of those in turn. Starting off simple, linear discriminant analysis is actually a really great and very commonly used technique. It's simple and it works. It goes by uh, certain aliases, also Fisher's linear discriminant, FLD, but more commonly you're gonna see it as LDA. It is a discriminative method. It is inherently a binary classifier. Some important considerations in this, the features need to be linearly separable. So if those data clusters are all kind of uh, interspersed amongst each other, there could be some nonlinear projection that would separate them. And we will talk about that in our discussion of support vector machines. But in this case, uh, you need to have clearly linearly separable data for this work. Your classes have to be uh, very, very obviously different Mathematically, we're simply uh, applying a series of learned weights against a vector of inputs. The transpose of those, of course, yields a scalar value plus some weight offsets. And all we look at is the sign of the resultant computation. So if it's positive, it gets one class label. If it's negative, it gets another. It's very, very simple, straightforward mathematics, but elegant in its simplicity, right? Some examples of two class uh, BCI problems could be the left right cursor control of the Galaga video that I just posted. It could also be push button on off control for video game triggers uh, like that Doom video we saw. Or going more into the kind of medical application, if you have somebody in a nonverbal state, maybe close to a coma, uh, this might be a uh, way for them to communicate yes or no through motor imagery or some other uh, 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 mental effort that can be detected in a non-invasive measure like EEG. So LDA. LDA is really, really similar, almost exactly the same as the oldest kind of primogenitor of deep learning today, the perceptron. This is uh, a kind of 50s futurist title for some really cool math first described by Frank Rosenblatt in 1958. And Marvin Minsky, the kind of AI great from MIT back in the day, uh, wrote this, this great report for the U.S. government on the state of the pursuit of generalized AI when computers uh, kind of spun up after World War II. 
And in this paper, um, Marvin Mitsky dismisses them as kind of trivial toys that don't have, don't likely have any kind of future. He basically thought that there was no possible way that they could uh, perform any kind of complicated or meaningful pattern classification either. So I think uh, that's kind of a semi-hilarious misstep uh, with the benefit of historical perspective, of course, that he didn't have half a century ago. But I digress. Perceptrons are a discriminative method that are also inherently binary. And if you exclude this kind of activation function on the outside, you have exactly an LDA. Some inputs paired with some weights that you will adjust and learn to produce a scalar weighted value. And then some class decision based on without the activation function, that could just be the sign again, right? Or it could be some learned threshold scalar value above 0.7 or below 0.7. Again, you need features that can be linearly separable in this formulation, uh, which also means that, you know, put this all together and the use cases for perceptrons and LDA are basically the same. And perceptrons are kind of a historical curiosity. So. <laughs> In a sense, maybe Marvin Minsky was right. It wasn't perceptrons that uh, had a future. It was deep learning, which is a composite of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of perceptrons. Uh, in any case, uh, so mostly in the literature, you'll see LDA. You won't see perceptrons anymore, except for a educational or didactic tool like this. I will note that the thing that makes perceptrons uh, stand out from... LDA is this link function, this activation function, which often starts out with a sigmoid kind of function. Uh, it approximates a step function, essentially, and your two steps, the extremes of those uh, that sigmoid, are, of course, your two classes. But once you have a link function in there, you are generating a distribution that maps an input spectrum to an output spectrum. Right. So you can consider other uh, nonlinear functions and continuous value functions that are not just approximating step functions once you get into more complicated adaptations of the perceptron. So perceptron, interesting historical curiosity. We did mention that they are the primogenitor of all deep learning today, which, as you've probably heard, has been fairly successful recently. Uh, deep learning, of course, can actually be a lot of things. It can be discriminative. It can be generative. These are suitable for a multi-class classification, just like we see here in MNIST. They can have discrete outputs. They can have continuous outputs. They can be paired up with uh, reinforcement learning, but then you're kind of really getting off topic for PCI. Uh, Importantly, the features are learned automatically, which is in contrast to some of the other techniques that require significant a priori knowledge and feature engineering. So you have to manually decide what you're going to plug into your algorithm. In this case, the uh, deep learning or the neural networks learn the rules implicitly which is advantageous in that you can assume a, a kind of an optimal solution given the data that you feed it. It's disadvantageous in that it's hard to interpret. And while there are kind of uh, new techniques that make explainable AI more uh, tractable these days, uh, more or less, a lot of the deep learning is a black box and you don't really know what the algorithm is latching onto or what transformations are happening that, happen that, that contain the useful information. When I first explain uh, 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 neural networks or, or deep learning neural networks, particularly convolutional networks that are really, really good at object recognition, visual perception tasks, I always like to refer them to this delightful website by a, a grad student at Ryerson up in Canada. And what you're seeing here is his visualization of all of the neurons represented by each box in these boxes. So all of the neurons in each layer of an MNIST classifier, a digit classifier. And in the website, it's interactive, so you can actually play around with inputs and draw what uh, it decodes and then in real time it shows you what all of the features are step by step layer by layer and it i, I think it's it's really really the best visualization of a convolutional neural network that i've ever seen
moving on to applications in EEG, there have been deep neural networks applied to uh, EEG. This is a recent work from a, a nice group that looked at first deep convolutional neural networks and then actually showed quite nicely that with EEG signals, you, you don't need all of the deep layers. You can actually get away with what they call a shallow a convolutional neural network. And this is fed time series, EEG time series. And what the network does, it essentially learns how to band pass the EEG into relevant spectral features and then put them into uh, output classes corresponding to different types of motor imagery. So this is a discriminative model with a four class output where a subject imagines uh, left hand movement or right hand movement or moving their feet or resting as a, a baseline condition there. And these very, very simple few, like three, three or four layer uh, neural networks can learn to classify these states as well or better than all of the other state-of-the-art non-neural network models and also as well as the deep neural network models in this case, which also tells you a little something about the limits of the information that are available in the EEG signal, something that you're measuring all the way out on the scalp instead of directly in the brain. If you're interested in learning more about uh, neural networks in BCI, I highly encourage you to check out this brain decode package, which is nicely annotated with a help file uh, web or, or interactive help on the, on the web and a Git repository for you to play around with your own PyTorch code in this application here. The Shearmaster paper is Deep Learning with Convolutional Neural Networks for EEG. It's a monster, but it's a really, really great read. And speaking of resources for neural networks and deep learning, I do want to briefly mention what I found to be really helpful in understanding all of the components of neural networks uh, and, and, and AI here. Uh, the first is this classic book by Chris Bishop. I love this. Uh, neural Networks for Pattern Recognition. Uh, I will admit that it didn't become fully transparent to me until I had paired it with some of these other uh, treatments of the topic. And I actually highly recommend if you're going to be learning anything at, at this level of sophistication in engineering to try to read broadly as possible to get different perspectives so that you can distill out the perspective that speaks to you and your experience and links your understanding best. I'll also recognize, um, recommend his Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning book, which actually I think is the best treatment of support vector machines that I've seen. We'll touch on those later. And believe it or not, this tome on artificial intelligence, which is a classic, the Russell and Norvig in the artificial intelligence field, it's, it's mainly looking at kind of like general AI, the kind of, uh, you know, like a robot, right? Instead of neural network AI, like we're talking about here, which are simply perceptual engines at this point. But it also has some really lucid treatments of a lot of these machine learning methods. So it's worth taking a look at if you have some time. Okay, so moving away from neural networks, uh, another popular machine learning method is the support vector machine. These are uh, similar to a LDA approach, but they have several important differences that also give them new capacities to, to extend beyond the capability of a simple LDA. Support vector machines are discriminative approaches and they are inherently binary, which is a drawback in many cases. Uh, you can get around this by stacking several decision trees in your support vector machine framework. And that's done frequently in the neuroimaging literature, for example, to parse the enormous data space that you can suck out of an MRI machine in functional magnetic resonance imaging. Okay, the really cool thing about support vector machines is that the data features do not have to be linearly separable. 
they can be so this is worked around with something that's called the the kernel trick which essentially is just taking data that otherwise can't be separated linearly and projecting them into some higher dimensional space and devising a separating hyperplane in that higher dimensional space that turns out to separate the data well. Uh, to find the separation of the hyperplane, it actually, instead of calculating centers of mass and means in clusters, for example, this is looking at the maximum margin between the classes in each of those higher dimensions. So it has been proven uh, in, a, in a mathematical proof that this tends to be the optimal solution that can be learned by sophisticated mean variance cr number crunching approaches. But by just skipping to calculating the support vectors and working only with the boundary cases, you can skip all of the computation on the rest of the data and really optimize your computation time. That's why support vector machines are so popular with big data analytics. You can throw in enormous amounts of data and crunch through it in computationally tractable time frames because the, uh, the, the framework is only operating on such a small subset of the data that you feed it. This is also where you encounter things like radial basis functions and Gaussian kernels, which are the, the uh, basis for projecting into that higher dimensional space. One drawback of support to vector machines is that it requires manual feature engineering, and in the BCI case, that means manual signal processing. So we touched on that Schirmeister neural network paper that the, the framework automatically learns how to band pass time series and uh, take away DC offsets and do all the signal processing that we're typically used to doing ourselves. Support vector machines need us to do that for them. So to carry that analogy forward, you would have to actually band pass the time series and pull out the spectral power estimates in, say, the alpha band that you're interested in that correspond to the different classes that you're trying to label. Now, you can actually turn that con into a pro by considering a kitchen sink approach. One advantage of support vector machines is they uh, are not harmed or their performance doesn't suffer from the addition of extraneous, redundant, or correlated variables. It just learns how to kind of zero them out essentially. So you can feature engineer a whole ton of information from your, your data set and then let the algorithm tell you which is important. And you'll note in contrast to neural networks, a support vector machine by looking at the weights, it's not as straightforward as that, but there are techniques to look at the weights of support vector machines and interpret which features are actually important for separating the data classes, which makes them much more uh, readily accessible for interpretation. So far, we've discussed a lot of discriminative methods and some generative methods, and the discriminative approaches have uh, more or less been binary in, by, by their nature. The first inherently multi-class technique that we'll draw your attention to here are, are derivatives of nearest neighbor classifiers, and these are proximity-based decision-making heuristics to simply define a center of mass for a class and then find nearby data points, labeling them by the proximity to either a center of mass of the classes that you're interested in or by the margins. These are different derivatives. And in this case, you can um, tell it to classify as many class neighbors as you would like without having to stack multiple binary classifiers in sequence. Now, there are so, so many more techniques. We didn't even cut, touch on regression here, which fortunately is something that you will likely cover in your practicum later on in the course after, I think module seven will start your practicum. Uh, please also pay close attention to the material in the, chap the chapter associated with this module in the, in the Rao Intro to BCI book. Uh, concerning the methods for evaluating your algorithm performance. This is ROC curves, information measures, all of this really uh, merits its own lecture here, but 
we will stop for the moment with this overview of the commonly used techniques and cover the evaluation in a separate lecture. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to shoot us an email, come to office hours on Monday night at 8 p.m. And definitely check out some of those resources. Many of them are websites that are free to access. Many of them have PDFs that are free and available for download. And if you can afford some of the textbooks, then uh, you can find international copies that are typically on the order of 30 to $50 and some of the best purchases that I think I've made in recent time. Thanks for paying attention and I will see you next time.